Good morning. My name is Julian and Ian. I'm a Dean Getches Fellow here upstairs at the law school. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our panel on water rights and the Ute tribes. We have got several fine panelists with us here today. Uh, the first is Scott McElroy, and he is representing the Southern Ute Tribe in some water issues and also runs, um, has a private practice here in Boulder, Colorado. Our second is Celine Hawkins, and she is Associate General Counsel for the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe down south. Finally, we've got uh, Dr. Mesquina, and he is an engineer by trade and helps out the Ute Tribe of Utah on some of their water issues. And Justice Hobbs has been serving on the Colorado State Supreme Court since 1996. And I was, I'm sure you all know, writes prolifically on water issues such as this in the state. So today we've decided to kind of mix things up a little and we're doing a question and answer format. So we've selected some topics and we've been talking amongst ourselves that kind of reflect where the Ute tribes have come um, and where they're going to be heading on these water issues. So the way that this panel will be run is we're going to present one question and have each um, panelist respond to that question. And we'll have a series of questions and we're going to reserve some time for a Q&A session at the end of the panel. So without any further introductions, I'd like to uh, start us off by talking about some of the incentives to settle and the history behind these settlements. So Scott McElroy will be our first speaker on this. And he's going to be introducing the Southern Ute Tribe's history. Thank you. Um, you know, nobody's ever talked about the Colorado Ute settlement in less than two or three days. So this is going to be a little bit of a, a challenge here. Um, I've been rep representing the Southern Ute Tribe on its settlement matters and litigation since 1985. Prior to my involvement, the, the tribal um, rights have been to the U.S. Supreme Court on the question of whether or not the issues surrounding the tribal rights under federal law should be de decided in state or federal court. Ultimately, the Supreme Court, in what we call the Aiken case, decided that the issues should be resolved in, in state court. Um, and so we began settlement in talks in 1985. And I think before I talked about the incentives, it's probably useful to just give a little short history of the settlement. In, in comparison to what occurs nowadays in most of the Western states, our settlement initially moved very quickly. We started settlement in 1985. Um, we concluded a settlement agreement at the end of 1986. We got legislation passed by 1988. Um, the litigation itself that was the subject of the settlement, this is a picture of the Southern Ute Reservation, and you can see multiple streams across that. The green land is the land that the tribe still owns. White land, the, the white areas are fee land owned by others. Um, you can see some reacquired land in there. But the litigation, can we show the big map? The litigation expanded, covered both reservations um, and all the watershed in southwest Colorado and all the streams that cross the reservation. Um, and, and that's important to note because much of what we hear about um, the, the Colorado Ute Settlement involves the Animus La Plata project because it, it has been undoubtedly the most controversial part of the settlement over the years. The, the, for the two tribes, they got, as a result of the settlement, somewhere around 300,000 acre feet of water. Our opponents like to say that's more water than the state, or than the state of Nevada got from the Colorado River. I could never figure out why that was a problem, but that's what they tended to say. Um, we had a very difficult time, uh, an impossible time, implementing the settlement as it was originally crafted with a much larger Animus La Plata project than one sees today. That was because of environmental issues, some cost issues, and ultimately in 2000, uh, additional legislation was passed that downsized the project, made it only a municipal and industrial water supply, 
and sort of flip-flop the tribal participation in the project from about a third of the water supply to two-thirds of the water supply, but for a smaller project. Um, so there was a long history to it, and one in which I think is kind of unique throughout the Western United States. Some, some of the issues, and I'll get into the question of incentives or factors that contributed it to the settlement. Um, it's a little different in terms of the way the parties approached it. Um, first, I want to say, you know, in my mind, unquestionably, the one factor that contributed the most to the settlement was the leadership of the two, of the two tribes. Obviously, I was more involved with Southern Ute than Ute Mountain, but um, the leadership did what you have to do in settlement discussions, which is know what, what they wanted and what, they, what the tribe needed, and also what was maybe not so important to them in the context of a comprehensive settlement discussion. I was sort of struck when Charles Wilkinson spoke yesterday about his contrast between the two tribal leaders in, uh, in, in the 19th century. Um, we, we had some contrasts too. We had some of the tribal leadership were, um, could always see the big picture, proceeded ahead with the details, marched ahead methodically. Some folks were a little more um, warlike, if you will, um, in approaching things. But for both tribes, they always had a vision of what they wanted to see. And, and at least at Southern Ute, it stretched across um, a wide range of tribal leadership, um, different chairmen at different times, always had a vision that settlement would be better and storage of water on the Animas River which contributes, of, of which on an average about 700,000 acre feet of water leave the state each year in the Animus, that storage on the Animus River w was necessary and important. So we had tribal leadership that was politically very courageous in terms of identifying what they wanted and what they didn't necessarily have to have as part of a settlement and a recognition by that tribal leadership that storage, as opposed to what we might call paper rights in a river with a lot of water, but which sometimes has almost no water, that storage was very important to that. Um, at the same time, we had a lot of leadership from the local, from the local community and on the state level. There were individuals, and I think when you talk about the local community, I think there are individuals who get credit, but who much as um, <clears throat> Lieutenant Governor Garcia said yesterday, identified that Southwest Colorado working with the tribes would be better off than Southwest Colorado fighting with the tribes um, and going forward. And then we had really quite remarkable leadership within the state. Um, perhaps that's not too surprising at the time we started the negotiations. Uh, Dean Get David Getches was the head of the Department of Natural Resources under um, Governor Lamb, um, but a much different attitude than at least I had experienced elsewhere. When I started on these negotiations, I'd been involved in some pretty nasty litigation in Arizona and Nevada, where the state clearly saw its role to attack tribal rights and defend state law rights. The state of Colorado, almost without exception, has brought to the table an attitude that it has tribal citizens, it has other citizens, the tribes have rights under federal law, other people may have rights under state law. It, it was their job to see that those two categories of rights were meshed, but it didn't see its job as some other states have as advocating for state law rights against tribal rights. So I think the people in the leadership are, are significant. Um, I've never quite understood at the state level whether it was really individuals or it was really a community within the state that took a, a much more positive attitude and contributed to the settlement. Then, of course, there was the Animus La Plata project. It's a project that a lot of people, the state and others, and certainly in the local community, had worked on for years. So there was sort of a common goal 
for what folks would like to see come out of the settlement which was an ability to go forward with the storage project and and finally um, <clears throat> I say this only jokingly because half jokingly because people have have never I think said it expressly but at the same time we were entering into these negotiations Dr. Mezgina, Tom Echohawk and others had just um, for lack of a more technical term, beat the hell out of the state of Wyoming in a water rights adjudication on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming, where the common statement is the state of Wyoming paid $11 million to find out that the tribes had senior rights to over 500,000 acre feet of water. Um, so there was an incentive on the state's part to find a better result than that one that benefited um, all of the citizens, but also avoided the, both, both the controversy and the bitterness that long time litigation can result in, um, as well as adverse effects from the litigation itself. So I, I think the incentives were really an ability of folks to see the big picture and to keep going and, and once we got past sort of the initial hurdle of putting the settlement together, a real desire to see the benefits of the settlement realized. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to particularly say good morning to my boss, Peter, and to the tribal council members who are present here today. I was three when the settlement negotiations began, so I'm really glad Scott is here today um, to talk about that. <laughs> I obviously was not working as a lawyer for the tribe. <laughs> um, and so I don't have a whole lot to say about the general history, but there's something that I thought would be helpful to talk about because I think it is something that we see a lot in litigating or settling water rights in Indian country. Um, could you flip to my map? This is my favorite map to use because instead of showing roads, it shows the major tributaries into the San Juan River. And within the red boundaries, you will see the portion of the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation in New Mexico and Colorado. Utah is not really included, and I'm not planning on speaking about Utah today. And as you can see, there's one major tributary um, on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation. It's the Mancus River, um, and you can see that when it leaves the reservation, it flows across um, important state lines that are important for compact and other purposes. And so, before the settlement, during the 20th century, what we saw on the Mancus River um, upstream of the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation is a whole lot of non-tribal water development. And this included a water project that was partially funded with federal dollars. And this includes a fairly comprehensive set of ditches um, in the Mancus River Valley, which again is, you can see Mancus on, on that river. The reservoir isn't shown, it's actually an, an off-stream reservoir. They divert by ditch to take the water there. And so, where the tribe entered the settlement negotiations is that it had an 1868 priority date, which is a very senior priority date in that basin, but there were a lot of existing non-tribal uses upstream of the reservation that were already depriving the Ute Mountain Ute tribe of its historic stream flow. And I guess I think it's important to point this out because we see this fairly regularly when we're working on, on water rights in Indian country is that you enter into litigation or settlement <coughs> negotiations where you have upstream, sometimes downstream, but a lot of times upstream, non-Indian uses that are already uh, really dependent on the tribal water. And this creates um, a lot of problems in, in trying to quantify or craft settlements. And so, I just think it's important that we also realize that we had a pretty 
nasty litigation battle teed up on the Mancus River. And what we ended up with is a subordination of the tribal water rights on that river, which means that we allowed the then existing adjudicated rights to continue on the Mancus River, and the tribe received water from the Dolores Project, which you can see is not that far away, but also not really close to the reservation. So I think that's important um, when you think about the battles that, that the tribes and the project proponents at ALP had. A lot of times when the tribes are taking project water, it's because they're trying to accommodate the existing non-Indian uses in the basin so that we can have settlements and litigation move forward without actually depriving existing uses of water. I'm not sure I have a whole lot more to say. I know I haven't used my time. I will use it elsewhere, or I will just defer to the next person. <laughs> All right, <laughs> moving on. I, I need the time. <laughs> I can't borrow it from you. You've got a taker. <laughs> OK, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, the topic that I'm going to discuss is the unfinished water rights settlement of the Ute Indian tribe in Utah. Uh, this, unlike, you know, uh, uh, the, their uh, brothers and sisters in the South, their water rights negotiation have been going on for almost half a century. It started in 1965, and it's not finished yet. <coughs> and so a portion of it has been finalized and the portion of it is not finished, and that's the reason why it is difficult to uh, present it. But in any case, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, as you can see um, on the map uh, behind me, the Uinta and Ore of the Ute Indian Reservation located in northeastern uh, Utah was established by executive order in 1861 and further expanded in 1882 uh, to include along, you know, lands along the Green River Basin. Uh, by a number of uh, congressional acts spanning from 1902 to 1905, the U.S. government granted the executive order in a, I mean by executive order, uh, granted allotment to tribal members. And about the same time when um, the government was granted individual allotments to uh, tribe, tribal members, and at, uh, at about that time, the government also opened the reservation for non-Indian homesteads. The U.S. government started to construct the Uinta Indian Irrigation Project, which, is, which was about 80,000 acres of allotted lands in 19, 19, 1905. At the time, the BIA was construction systems on the tribal allotted lands. The homestead non-Indians were also uh, very busy developing their own irrigation projects right and left within the reservation competing for the same waters with the Indians and oftentimes with the assistance of the government. Also, in about 1905, the U.S. filed an application to state engineer for a state water right, and the state engineer issued certificate of appropriation for the project with a priority date of 1905. With time, a large portion of the allotted lands uh, and their associated water rights were acquired by non-Indians in the project, creating a checkerboard pattern of Indian and non-Indian lands. As a result, competition of irrigation water intensified and led to more conflicts between Indians and non-Indians. In 1923, mindful of the winter's decision of 1908, the U.S. filed in federal court to determine the quantity and priority of tribal water rights in the Uinta Indian Irrigation Project, and the court decreed water right for about 60,000 acres. Remember, they started with 80,000, and now 60,000 acres, and then associated water right of about 180,000 acres. So in a sense, uh, which you will, um, I will discuss later on, uh, there is 120,000 acres of land that was finally you know, agreed upon by all the parties for the uh, Indian tribes' uh, water rights. 60,000 acre feet with an associated 180,000 acre feet was decreed by court. 
only the 60,000 acres or the remaining, you know, uh, 300,000 acre feet was really based on negotiations. Although the 1923 decree granting 1861 priority right gave the tribe's senior priority relative to non-Indian water uses, the court gave a water duty of only three acre feet per acre where the norm in the region is four acre feet per acre. <coughs> also, the court granted the tribe senior right to the natural flows of the rivers. However, uh, the natural flows of the rivers occur in spring and early summer up to the end of June whereby during the months of July and August, when the crop consumptive yield demand is high, the river flows are sufficient to irrigate the project for only three out of 10 years. The only way the tribes can satisfy their crop water demand is natural flow supplemented by storage, by storage and the court failed to provide storage water to the tribe. Consequently, storage, uh, storages are a must to satisfy the irrigation water demands for the Uinta Indian Irrigation Project. Can I have the next two slides? Yeah. This is, as you can see, this is the problem. Uh, the natural flow is, as you can see, the blue line here. You know, it starts, you know, to uh, in somewhere in June, it is in its peak. And then it descends down very fast, as you can see. In, in August, July and August. The, the consumptive use or the, the water demand, as you can see the red line, you know, there is, it's satisfied up to the end of June, but from June onwards, there is, you know, the demand is higher than the supply of water. So, uh, the tribes are not getting enough water during this month, July and August. That's the big problem that we have. The next one, Julie. So, so what needs to be done is, you know, there is tremendous amount of supply of water here during the early season. And that season should be stored. I mean, the water that comes during the season should be stored and be released for the crop to, do, you know, to um, satisfy the crop water demands during July and August. So this is the problem. There is a mismatch between the water supply and the water demand. And this has been going on since 1905, and it is going also now up to you know 2013. This is the biggest problem that the youth tribes have. In the 1950s and 1960s, the state of Utah, with the support of the federal government, endeavored to construct the largest and most complex water project, the uh, the Utah um, I mean in Utah named Central Utah Project, the largest and most important component of the Central Utah project is the Bonneville unit that would transfer water, among others, from the reservation to the Salt Lake City metropolitan area. In order for the project to be economically feasible and receive congressional funding, the state and the federal government asked the tribe to defer development of some of the tribe's future water rights and provide the water to the Central Utah project. In 1965, the tribe agreed to defer the development of a portion of its irrigable land of 15,242 acres, amounting to 60,000 acre feet of water right, so that the Central Utah Project could certify to Congress that the Bonneville unit of the Central Utah Project could proceed without objection from the tribe and that unchallenged, unchallenged water right existed. By the way, actually, they ended up deferring development of 29,000 acres, not only 15,000 acres. The tribe knew that it must have storage to successfully irrigate its lands in the Uinta Basin, as you, as mentioned earlier. So in exchange for delaying the development of a portion of the tribe lands, the federal government and Central Utah Water Conservancy District agreed, among others, to construct one, a make-up irrigation water uh, project for the deferred lands of the tribes. Two, to construct irrigation storage to supplement the shortage of natural flow of the rivers that supply irrigation water to the Uinta irrigation project, as you have seen it earlier in the map. Three, give full recognition to the tribes quantified reserved water rights based on practicably irrigable acreages. So really in 1965, the water rights of the tribes were more or less really finalized. So the 1965 deferral agreement was of great benefit to the growing population of the Wasatch Front, including 
the Salt Lake City area also. The Central Utah project consisted of six units, including the Bonneville, the green one that you see, the Yipalco, this is called the Yipalco, and this is the Uinta, this is the Vernon, and this is the Jensen and the Ute Indian tribe here that diverts water from Green River to all these areas. So the three projects, the three projects are built, which is the Bonneville, the Vernon, and the Jensen. The three projects that were supposed to benefit the tribes are not built. So I'll discuss a little bit about them. Okay, so at, as time went on, as, as time went on, as time went by, Congress would not support the entire cost of the Central Utah project because the cost overruns and because of cost overruns and mismanagement. When Utah returned to Congress in late 1980s for money, for more money to complete the Central Utah project, Congress established the Central Utah Project Completion Act and <coughs> under this act, the, sto the, oh, I mean, the storages promised to the Ute tribes were not going to be built after all the years the tribe was promised storage to put its reserve water right to use. This is nothing but a, a tragedy of humanity. Negotiations of water right quantification took place starting at the end of 1970s to the early 1990s. Some of the major points the parties agreed upon include the total amount of the tribe water right, the stream from which the water right is derived, and the priority day. All these are set in stone, so all parts are agreed on these issues. The agreed claim of the tribe water right is about 480,000 acre feet. In 1992, the tribe was pressured to accept a congressional legislation to settle their water rights, although the tribe has yet to finalize and accept the water compact. The legislation included compensation money in lieu of some of the projects that were not constructed but the compensation is nothing near the benefits the tribes would have received if the projects had been developed. Because the tribes would not ratify the compact without storages, among others, the tribes and the state are now back and discussing the issues pertaining to administration and storages. It appears that thus far some progress has been made. Sorry, I've gone too much of my time. You were donated some extra time. I think <laughs> yes, you're still doing you. okay. <laughs> Justice Hobbs? Well, I, I thought that was just terrific. I, I've never seen an explanation of the Central Utah project like you just gave. Okay, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank you. It really helped. Uh, yeah. Um, can I read a poem? Sure. Thanks. I want to recognize my law clerk, Daniel Cordalis, of this law school for helping me get prepared for this panel today. It's, it's his wife, Amy. Allison Flint, also of this law school, former clerk of mine. Wonderful to see you here and out. Out in practice, Allison, you're doing good work. So here's the poem, and I love that first panel this morning. I, I am sorry I was not able to get here yesterday. And I am going to have to be leaving back to, to the court at 1230, so it, with apologies, please. So this poem is called San Juan, Our Way Out of It. San Juan, Our Way Out of It. And, of course, that's the, that's the key river in the southwest. Uh, and of course, everything you talked about, you know, on our side here, we have a common watershed link. Uh -huh. The river is our elder, our mother and our father. Celebrate our elder. Celebrate we, the children of our elder. We, the brash, the sometimes rash, the often bewildered hatchlings, dispersed, flushed, and overheated. That's the lawyerly part of it, Over, <laughs> overheated. How do we find our way back home? How do we find our way back home? Perhaps we need a temperature control device, a mixing mechanism. Perhaps we need to invest in our contributaries, marshal our basin-wide counterintuitives. Preserving our many ways of knowing and perceiving Perhaps we can San Juan our way out of jeopardy. Some treatment might be available, even though we don't understand the cause and effect. Why be so uncertain of our capabilities? Don't we know the ancestors watch over us? 
Don't we know the ancestors watch over us? Don't we know we migrate back and forth within them? And they within us? Don't we know a trade route of immense worth passes through Mexico? A water frog with turquoise eyes dwells at the mouth of a spring at the base of a cliff in Casas Grandes. Shall we dwell in the great houses of our many communities? Shall we dwell in the great houses of our many communities? So that's from uh, my book, Living the Four Corners, published by CLE of the Colorado Bar Association, along with other writings. This is the Headwaters Magazine on Southwest Colorado. You have an excerpt of it in your materials. Uh, and some of this history that Scott so well talked about uh, is, in, uh, is captured in this Headwaters magazine. All the 30 Headwaters magazines of the Water Foundation, which was established in 2002 by the Colorado legislature to be non-political, non-advocacy uh, education, are downloadable from the website cfwe.org. 30 Headwaters magazines. There are also nine citizen guides to various aspects of Colorado water. And of course, Colorado water, since we produce water for 19 states, that includes Colorado, but 18 downstream states in the Republic of Mexico, I think you will find on the website a lot of that of material here that will be of interest to you. So uh, it's a great professional uh, joy in my life to be associated with a Supreme Court, a state Supreme Court that has the McCarran jurisdiction. And when David Robbins and I entered into the AG's office, the Attorney General's office of Colorado in 1975, they're sitting before us to work on was the Mary Aiken case, the third in the trilogy of cases involving whether states could adjudicate Federal Reserve water rights and uh, Native American water rights claims. And of course, we learned from that 1976 decision of the US Supreme Court that there's concurrent jurisdiction between the federal courts and the state courts, even when the McCarran, uh, you know, which is the uh, uh, 1952 act that allows the states to assume jurisdiction over federal water rights claims and tribal water rights claims, there's still concurrent jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, the 10th Circuit did, then had to defer. <laughs> this came out of the 10th Circuit. And I'm sure the tribes uh, probably argued at the time uh, that, you know, they would rather trust the feds. But we got the jurisdiction, okay? <laughs> and so the whole idea of the McCarran Amendment is to integrate all the water rights on the stream systems uh, within which the state of Colorado has uh, an interest, and to do it fairly and justly. So I've written a law review article, which is in the DU Water Law Review, called uh, uh, <laughs> state water politics versus an independent judiciary. And that article deals with the fact that when a decision was made, they, these were wilderness water rights, not in, tribal water rights, in Idaho in favor of the wilderness water rights, the Idaho delegation became unglued and so did the uh, all the water interests in Colorado, the non-Indian, non-federal water interest. There was a petition for rehearing and the decision in favor of the Federal Reserve water rights was reversed on rehearing when the Chief Justice moved from the dissent to the majority. Now that is a shocking occurrence, all right? Now judges are supposed to, you know, be independent of politics and we do have the right, if we're wrong, to move on a petition from re for rehearing from the dissent to the majority, but one can't help feel the overwhelming political reason for a justice making that move. So I think when a state has the McCarran jur jur uh, uh, jurisdiction as we do, uh, we have to apply federal law, federal substantive law, of course, 
I'm not saying whether a wilderness water right exists or not, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying that matter could have gone up to the U.S. Supreme Court on that case without the Idaho Supreme Court reversing itself under political pressure. So we in Colorado enjoy having been removed from politics uh, and we have the merit selection system and we don't have to spend a minute of our time thinking about the political implications of water cases, which can be many and varied and fierce. So I think we have to apply the federal law. That's our duty and our, our predecessors on the Colorado Supreme Court said that in the 1983 case that Justice Erickson wrote, City and County of Denver, there were two cases having to do and very clearly was stated by the Colorado Supreme Court that we will honor federal substantive law. Now the procedural law applies, right? You know, the procedure of the court applies. So we have this nice resume notice, right? Comes out monthly, all the claims are there, federal, state, you know, prior appropriation, reserve water rights, everything else, declaration of what a prior decree said, all these various applications. Pay attention! You know, this unfortunate case, this King case, which I had to write the decision on, the tribe missed, for whatever reason, of filing the statement of opposition timely fashion. You know, there are lawyerly things to be done here, and I'm not here to criticize anybody, but what I'm saying is that we're in this together, so, you know, uh, we do need to pay attention uh, to our jobs, and, uh, and continue to work on this. Now, I have followed the Ute settlement since the time I was in the AG's office. I was counsel of the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District for 17 years before Governor Romer put me to the court. You're sitting in the Northern District today. Um, and I take pride in the fact that that district supported whenever we were asked by the tribes and their council to support the construction of the Animus La Plata project to settle the 1868 undoubted in my mind based on what I know of the history and, uh, and the scholarship involved reserve water right for the Ute Indians and uh, their decision which we need to honor to subordinate that right to get along with their neighbors through the construction of the project. So one final matter that I would like to bring up because I think it's of interest probably to you young lawyers. So this Anima, Animus La Plata Water Conservancy District was challenged as being illegally formed. It was part of this uh, long history of opposition in the Animus La Plata project that Scott McElroy alluded to which was fiercely waged and the community had a lot of dissension down there in southwest Colorado about this even though this was a water rights for the Native Americans there were lots of other things that got injected into it uh, so I was called upon by uh, Mr. Maines who was representing uh, the Southern Ute Tribe and my own clients to figure out a way to validate that conservancy district so it could go ahead with its work. This was in front of Zeta Weinshank in the federal district court by the taxpayers for the Animus La Plata referendum to challenge the very validity of this organization that had been pursuing the project. And so, uh, Conservancy districts are formed through a petition and procedure and in, in the court and so on. So the issue was the validity, the legality of this district. So pressed against the wall, I, I uh, came to the uh, sudden intuition that there is a legislative branch of government and maybe the challenge of the legality of this political subdivision of the state could be cured by the legislature, drafted a bill which was introduced and went through the legislature, ratifying the Animus La Plata Water Conservancy District by an act of the Colorado legislature. Ben, he ben Nighthorse Campbell, who was in the legislature at that time, was interested in getting it through as quickly as possible. It went through in three days in the legislature. The rules of the various committees were suspended 
because this was viewed as an important public commitment to the tribes, in my view, and to the people of southwest Colorado who are trying to settle this issue. And then, of course, the issue was whether Judge Weinshank would dismiss the litigation because the legislature had now acted to cure the illegality of the political subdivision, and she dismissed the case, and the Tenth Circuit upheld it. So my point is this, there are three branches of government, right? Put your thinking cap on. But the main thing is, to me, uh, the satisfaction that I believe in Colorado we have a fair and honest system of water adjudication and that we will follow the law when called upon. At least I hope so. Thank you, Justice Hobbs. That's a nice segue into our next topic, which concerns the administration and implementation of these acts, or um, in the case of the U tribe of Utah, kind of where that might be headed. <laughs> So um, now if the panelists would maybe offer comments on how the tribes, state, and federal government work together in administering these acts, um, and also how you're planning on using the water possibly or future development plans. Thank you. Um, well, administration is a critical issue in any settlement um, of tribal water rights, and it was a critical issue here, maybe we could show the southern reservation. Um, for a number of reasons, as Justice Hobbs mentioned, the, the tribal rights, the, the question of the adjudication of the tribal rights had been decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, and we were in state court in Water Division 7 in Durango. Um, we had um, the McCarran Amendment talks about it, uh, adjudication and administration. There's been very limited litigation over what and administration means, but um, having been to the Supreme Court once, we weren't anxious to go again. Um, so what we attempted to do in, in the settlement, and, and ultimately the settlement is implemented by consent decrees, we call them consent decrees, at least two of them were not consented to ultimately, um, within, within the uh, Water Division 7 for each of the streams that crosses the two reservations. And so our effort was to try to put into the settlement agreement and ultimately into the consent decrees the critical, we actually tried to do them all, any substantive issue of law to have that defined within, within the consent decree itself so that substantively the nature of the water rights would be defined within, within the consent decrees themselves. Um, that, that was fairly easy, I, I say, today I say it was fairly easy, it didn't seem so easy at the time, um, capable of doing with the exception of, of the Animus La Plata project, the, the Animus and the La Plata rivers, because essentially, at least for the southern Utes, our primary claims for future rights were driven by agricultural purposes, and so we were able to assign to the tribal rights recognized in, in the settlement agreement and ultimately in the consent decrees all the necessary attributes um, under Colorado law. Um, we debated, so, so we tried to put together you know, a substantive document in the settlement agreement that defined things like that the water rights could not be abandoned or lost through forfeiture. We put in specific provisions about how a water right might be changed, um, and we put in the necessary attributes of the water right. Um, but that still left us with administration. And of course, administration takes on kind of a broad character. Sometimes it's the day-to-day -day that, you know, this is when you turn your head gate on, this is when you turn it off. Other times um, it begins to take on a more um, substantive nature and there's a gray area between what's substantive and what's purely procedural. But, but ultimately we landed on the notion that these consent decrees should be administered in much, but not exactly the same way that 
other water court decrees would be administered. For the southern Utes, it was, it was important because there are a few of the streams where we did relinquish our first priority, but you can tell by sort of looking at here, most of the tribal land is lower down on the river. So, I mean, in terms of enforcing the 1868 priority, for example, on the Piedra, we might have to shut off people upstream. And we wanted a system that would do that promptly and quickly, not some of the other alternatives that exist, like returning to court, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which takes a long time. So ultimately, we decided that if the substantive terms were defined well enough in the consent decrees and settlement agreement, that we could, uh, we could effectively have state administration of that water until the time it was delivered to the reservation. And when it was delivered to the reservation, or to the tribal lands, I should say, it would be under tribal control. And, and that was influenced, one, by what I said about the need for priority enforcement on a prompt basis, but also by some, some of the things that Justice Hobbs had said. I mean, Colorado, in my view, un unlike some other states, is, is a well-balanced state. If you look at the, at the water issues, you have farmers sometimes fighting with cities. You have people who want to develop water fighting with people who already have senior priority. You have a whole variety of interacting forces, and the, and the law evolves in response to all of those. In other states, you see things like, you know, one particular entity, mining or the cities, have dominated sort of the water um, culture and community over the years, and there, there's uh, less objectivity between the competing uses of water. Um, and, and so the fact that there was one, what seemed to be an unbiased, um, ultimately judiciary, but before that administrative system um, was significant, and, and there was no role, as there is in a state like New Mexico, for the administrative process to insert its view of the public interest, which frequently doesn't comport with the tribal view of what might be in the public interest. Um, and, and finally, because the rules, as opposed to perhaps some other states, are well established, sometimes it's better to know the rules, even if you don't know exactly how they're ultimately going to be applied, the fact that you can look at Colorado water law, Colorado procedure, just as Justice Hobbs said, um, and decide what you have to do in response to a particular procedural uh, event, and you know what you have to do, uh, is better than not knowing those sorts of things. So there was a pretty conscious effort to meld the procedure from the state with the substantive law of reserved rights in the process. And that, for the most part, has worked quite well as we've gone forward. When we, when we downsized the project, we had a very brutal court fight with opponents of the project um, who objected to any project and ultimately were objecting to the tribal rights. But the court worked its way through that. Um, and for the most part, um, well, the end result, it got right. It struggled a little bit with melding the substantive federal law <laughs> with the state procedural law. So generally, the process has worked well. We've had a few hiccups along the way, but, but for the most part, the process has worked well. I won't be deferring any time because this is where I actually do my work. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> At the risk of disagreeing publicly with the Colorado Supreme Court Justice, I do have a little bit of a response on the King Consolidated Ditch case. And it would be helpful for me to have my map back. Perfect. And what I want to talk about here is the difference between the state's role in administering the decrees for the tribal reserve water rights and the state's role in administering everybody else that wants to steal the tribal water. And I think those two things look a little bit different. I think we have some comfort with how the McCarran Amendment jurisdiction works when we're looking at 
administering the tribe's reserved rights. And often the focus of all the settlement negotiations is, is how are we going to administer the tribal water to the tribes. I think what's a more difficult question is once you have quantified and decreed water rights for a tribe, what, what is the tribe's role and responsibility in protecting its water rights against all other users? And I, I think that this is actually the fact pattern that led to the King Consolidated Ditch case, if I read the case right. And I, I think it poses a harder question. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that I do on the Mancus River. And again, remember that the tribe, the Ute Mountain Ute tribe did not give up its water rights on the Mancus River. Um, it subordinated those water rights to certain rights that were adjudicated prior to the settlement. So every month I get the water resume, I read the water resume, and I look at what's happening above the reservation in Mancus. Every year there's junior water rights that are developed upstream of the tribe. Um, and you know, there, it's not a huge amount of water, but it is something that concerns us. I have yet to file a late state statement of opposition, so I do work within the state <coughs> procedural rules. But one of the things that I find when I get into Division 7, I've opposed someone's case for a water right is if they're a pro se party, they usually have no idea why I'm there and don't really want to talk to me. And if they are a represented party, often what I hear from the attorneys is, why don't you just let Division 7 administer this water? When you put a call on the river, you will take our water rights. And I don't think that in reality, we should wait until the moment that we're calling junior water rights to try to deal with this issue. And so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is how tribes work to protect their water rights and particularly the water that they're not using yet but which they are absolutely entitled to use under law is something that I think a lot of tribal water attorneys um, sit up late at night thinking about. And then I don't want to get too far into this but we also think about this in the interstate context and looking at interstate compacts on the Colorado River and how changes in those compacts and the law of the river also has the ability to affect the tribal rights. So I guess it's not exactly disagreeing with you, but I think I, I actually <laughs> think that that case poses a, a really interesting question. To talk a little bit more about administration and implementation, what I wanted to talk about there was um, in the settlement legislation, we had language inserted that we were able to use Public Law 638 to pull down the contracting work on the water projects into tribal programs. Um, which means, for example, on the Animus La Plata project, it, it, it was the Ute Mountain Ute Tribes construction company, a wholly owned tribal enterprise, that entered into a public law 638 contract um, to do the work. My understanding is that this is still the largest public law 638 contract that has been implemented, and the tribes construction company not only finished the work properly, they finished it on time, which is pretty rare when you look at the development of federal water projects. When I was doing some work writing a law review article that's going to come out this spring, and I have to paraphrase because I don't have the language in front of me, one of the tribal leaders and elders who worked on the project essentially told me well, the way that we made sure that we got the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe settlement done and that we got our promised benefits is that we did it ourselves. And so I think it's important to realize that now that the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe has demonstrated that this is something that tribes can do, we're seeing this concept, it's not always through Public Law 638, but this concept of tribes building their own settlement implementation projects occur um, for other tribes that are getting water settlements now. And so I think that's really important to note here. The Southern Ute Tribe also had 638 contracting, and 
I also don't want to leave out that the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe also did the cultural resources mitigation work at the project. And when we think about how these projects can get stalled by something like having more cultural resources at the site than was anticipated, I think it's really important to note that having a tribe in charge of the cultural resources mitigation work made that project able to move forward in a way that I don't think it would have been able to move forward if they had not had the tribes with the good network of NAGPRA and other cultural resources issues taking the lead on that work. Okay, thank you. Um, earlier uh, in my discussion, uh, I pointed out that um, the uh, Ute Indian tribe water settlement is not complete. Uh, what we have is what the tribe believe is, the Ute tribe believe is that um, the deferred agreement of 1965 was entered into the Congressional Act of 1992. But the comprehensive water settlement for the entire uh, reservation is not finalized. So that's what we believe. So what we have is now two sets of issues. The first set of issue is that there is the 1992 uh, act, and that 1992 act is already been implemented. So I'm going to give you a short discussion about it, and then I'll go back to the administration portion of it, which we are still discussing with the state to finalize the administration. Uh, and as far as implement implementation is concerned, the Secretary of Interior set up an office in Utah to administer and implement all the requirements under the Central Utah Project Completion Act called CAPCA. The Ute Tribes projects and compensation funds were included in the responsibilities of CAPCA office. An economic development fund of $125 million established under the 1992 settlement has now been distributed to the tribe to administer itself, and the tribe invested the funds keeping the principal intact and budgeting the interest for annual tribal economic improvements. The tribe decided in the 1990s that it would only expend the principal from the authorized amounts and other funds are currently held by the secretary, and they are one. $45 million for tribal farming operations. The tribe ex expends interest from this account to assist tribal farmers who can make improvements on lands served by the U Uinta Indian Irrigation Project, and the tribe can use some of the funds to purchase land for farming and or feed operation. 20, second is $28.5 million for fish, wildlife, and recreation mitigation efforts due to the adverse impact from the construction of the Central Utah project. As I informed you earlier, the Central Utah project takes water from the reservation and takes it all the way to, um, to Salt Lake City area and so on. So there is some uh, adverse impacts that have occurred and there are some mitigation going on. The funds included repair and improvements of the existing tribal reservoirs used for recreation, stream habitat, and road improvements. The tribe has a fishery and, re and regulates fishing and recreation activities on the reservoirs. These projects have largely been completed, and there are remaining funds that the tribe can put to use consistent with original purpose of the funds. The third is $2.1 million uh, of Bonneville Unit Tribal Credits. Congress took a portion of the tribe's reserved water rights and requires that they be transferred to the Wasatch Front uh, in perpetuity and the tribe receives an annual payment from the Central Utah Project's use of these reserved water rights. Um, number four is the CAPCA office personnel were also designated as the Ute Tribe's reserved water right implementation team, generally directed by the Secretary's Office of Water Rights Settlements. But this is where difficulties have occurred. Because the state and the tribe had not completed their negotiations of Water of the Water Compact at the end of 1992 use settlement was passed, Congress included provision, provision that both state and tribal members may re-ratify Water Compact. And that's exactly what we are doing. We are, you know, the state of Utah and the Ute Indian tribes are already in discussion, in discussion mode. So to go back to administration, administration of water right is a topic that the tribe is discussing with the state of Utah. In fact, we were there uh, about 10 days ago. 
the tribe and the state are trying to clarify administration roles of the state and the tribe. The tribe's desire is to administer tribal water right and the state to administer state water right. There is a conceptually there is an agreement between the state and the tribes on this issue. As the point of diversion of the river, discussion is going on to establish a river management plan that will define natural flow and storage flow accounts and available supplies for the river commissioner to distribute water rights in accordance to priority with data transparent for every water, um, for every water user online. What this one will do is we are working together with the state, hopefully, you know, we have done our, our work, the tribes have done their work on this, is for each river where there are the major head gates, we are putting together a computer program that analyzes how much natural flow is available at each point, at every time, every hour. And how much water is available there from storage. So based on all this analysis, how much water is available for diversion. So we will have an agreement on this and put together that program. And that way, the tribes will know exactly what is going on. If the commissioner of the river is changing anything, then they will find out just like that and they can't stop him. So that's what we are doing on this issue. And there is an agreement on this issue also, but you know there, there will be detailed discussion in, in, in the future with the state. I think this has worked, by the way, successfully in other places, such as with the Shoshone Bannock tribes in Idaho. We have done it with the state of Idaho. The other important issue is the question of change of place, change of point of diversion, and change of use, as discussed earlier. We have, to start, we have started to discuss these issues with the state, even though we have not reached a, a final settlement, we are making tremendous progress also on these issues. Thank, Thank you. you. Justice House? <clears throat> I want to point out two things I left out there, if you didn't see them. Uh, one of the this, this sheet is the milestones in Colorado legal history. It's now in the Ralph Carr Center. Uh, up on the wall we have, uh, along with Lincoln and Jefferson, we have Chief Ignacio and Chief Buckskin Charlie. Uh, those figures are up there because of the consultation with the tribes about who they thought they wanted there. Uh, I think we're extremely proud of our learning center. I hope you come down and see it soon. Justice Sotomayor will cut the ribbon on it on May 2nd, but it's open now for beta testing. Uh, 81 milestones in Colorado legal history are grouped into 12 different topics. Very important topic uh, is Colorado's Native American heritage, along with its Hispanic heritage, civil rights, the rights of women, uh, we have a long way to go, but we've come a long way too. We've worked with historians and uh, scholars and uh, the tribes and others interested in putting this together. There's a lot more to be said, uh, but the point of it is when we own up to who we are, and that means who we were, who we are now, and who we will be, we're in this community together, and there is sovereignty uh, undoubtedly that's been uh, transgressed uh, for many years, this issue of the administration of water rights, I think uh, I'm a co-convener of the Western Water Judges Educational Project, Dividing the Waters. Uh, we're, uh, this is a judges group that meets periodically and uh, invites faculty to, to give us uh, their benefit of their experience. This uh, arena of uh, water administration is, is totally important. And I believe in the government-to-government -government consultation process. I believe our court does. I believe our state government does. And so if we're having, uh, and, and we want to allow our administrators, our, our water commissioners, to have discretion, yet they have to follow the decrees of the court, because we, this is a protection of rights, including the tribal water rights. In a stream system, haven't we learned we're all interrelated and we're all tied together? That's the whole reason for the McCarran adjudication. We do have a water court committee, is what I'm saying, that is a standing committee that I chair to the Colorado Supreme Court. 
and the state engineer and others are on this, maybe we ought to get a uh, representative of tribes or both tribes on that as well. Uh, but we would be interested if, 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 that, uh, if, if, if rules of the court are at issue that are obstructing the process or might help it. I certainly think we would be interested in convening the Water Court Committee to look at it. Uh, Real-time water administration uh, is being looked at very actively uh, to optimize, and that's, that's what we're supposed to do in our water laws, optimize the use of the resource for everyone involved. Uh, I think there's a lot of good work to be done in this administrator. I don't disagree at all with what you said. I just think you have to make a timely filing. Because <laughs> we're going to hold everybody else to that, too. That was my only point. All right. So it looks like we've got time for one more discussion question. So I'm going to go ahead and try to combine the final two topics. Um, so are there any limitations or restrictions in these settlements or negotiations that um, the tribes are working with? And what's, what's next for the future um, or creative ways to maybe get around those? And I will, let, let me respond before I get to that, just kind of briefly on the um, issue that Celine has raised. And I will say, I was not involved in the King Consolidated Ditch case, so I come at it somewhat objectively. But I think, I think if there is an issue that Indian country struggles with everywhere and, and which, if we had the benefit of revisiting um, the settlement, I think the issue that Celine points out makes some sense because the tribal rights by their very nature are future use rights and administering rights that are actually in use and applying the priority date and not allowing reliance to develop um, is, is better. I mean our right, the tribal rights are supposed to be the rights for all time. Um, as a practical matter, I don't know on the uh, Ute Mountain Reservation, on the Southern Ute Reservation, we essentially fully, by the time we were done, we fully appropriated each of the streams. I mean, there was no reliable water supply left. So junior water rights, changes in water rights are certainly an issue and one that requires diligence on the part of the tribes as we go forward. But let me turn to the topic that's in front of us. I mean, there are two sort of critical limitations in the settlement, in, in the settlement. Uh, one that comes out of the 1988 Act and one that comes out of the 2000 Act. I think the 2000 Act doesn't affect the tribes to the same extent that it, or affects Southern Ute to the same extent that it affected the non-Indians, which is when ALP was downsized, um, the water supply was limited to M&I purposes. And that hurt the tribes, both tribes had a significant amount of agricultural water uh, in the project and, and Southern Ute in particular was due to have about 3,400 acres of land actually developed as part of um, the project on the La Plata River. So the tribes got hurt by that. It was devastating to our non-Indian partners who had always seen ALP as a way to take that uh, rich water supply on the Animas River into the La Plata Basin where, where there's much better agricultural land. So that's one restriction. It was a, obviously a conscious choice by the tribes to go forward with a project that was limited to an M&I supply. Um, I think the tribes are very appreciative that the non-Indians were prepared to go forward with the settlement even though one of the benefits that they'd been promised in 1988 was not provided to them. The more significant restriction is on marketing. And it's not really a problem for marketing that any of the water or leasing it or transferring it in some ways to other parties within the state. There's a kind of a strange provision. Maybe, maybe Justice Hobbs can make sense of it because I think it's structurally just wrong. It, it's do unto others what they would do to you. So. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they, when we got back with the original um, settlement in, in the late 80s, certain staffers, and I guess certain people in, in Congress, were very concerned about the marketing of tribal reserved water rights. And their solution to that was to say that when the tribes used their water off the reservation, it would be a state water right, 
not deemed to be a state water right not to have the characteristics of a state water right but it would become a state water right i'm not sure how that happens but i'm not sure it's terribly significant in the long run either because there certainly water can be marketed transferred used within the state as i said earlier the rules are fairly clear the more difficult provision is one that deals with out of state marketing and one by making it a state water right it becomes subject to all of the various state requirements related to emphasizing the the use of colorado's water within colorado but also the compacts on the colorado river and we we spent a long time in the negotiations dealing with the out of state marketing question and we finally settled with the state of colorado on what we called neutrality which is whatever the law allows we would be allowed to do whatever the law disallowed we would not be allowed to do and nobody knew i don't think anybody still knows exactly what the answer is to that in terms of how the compacts on the colorado river uh, and other agreements affect tribal reserved water rights when we got to congress we met with an extremely rough reception um, and and i'd like to tell one one war story about it which is we got into the house it was still called the Natural Resources Committee or Interior Committee at that time, which was chaired by Mo Udall, a, a, a champion of tribal rights over the years in, in no uncertain terms. But it was Arizona, Nevada, California, all of who were dead set against any tribal uh, marketing of water across state lines, maybe even within the state, but their opposition was. And George Miller, someone who also has been uh, sympathetic to tribal issues over the years, actually introduced uh, prohibition on tribal marketing um, out of state, a flat out prohibition. And we opposed that, and it went to a vote in the Interior Committee. And Mo Udall, of all people, voted in favor of the prohibition. But at the end of the committee vote, the vote was a tie, which meant the <laughs> prohibition did not come into play. And I thought, boy, that's really good. Well, we found out later that as chairman of the committee, Mo Udall had authority to vote the territory votes who can vote on the committee. And he never voted any of them. So he, he got the public aura in Arizona of voting for the prohibition against marketing, but he allowed it to survive and move out of committee. Um, but that was our last victory on that issue. When we got to the Senate, we could not move the bill without the language that's now, now in the legislation, which basically says the water right is a state water right, so it's subject to the same restrictions that might apply to otherwise marketing Colorado water out of state. And for the ALP, water can't be moved into the lower basin of the Colorado uh, River unless another non-federal, non-Indian water user could, could market water in the lower basin. So we have fairly strict restrictions on out-of-state marketing. Um, things have changed fairly dramatically over the last few years in, in that course. There are things that the lower basin states have done nowadays that I think previously would have been considered violations of the compact. So, so that issue may become live in the future, but those are the principal restrictions. I'm glad you explained marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things that I think Julie wanted someone to talk about. Um, as to kind of where I see things going in, in the future, um, I think Southwest Colorado is going to be hit with a lot of drought and we're going to see climate change and we're going to see concerns in the whole region about what is happening to the water supply. And where I see some of the conversation going is about how you look at things like water quality and water quantity and general resource administration coming together. And I think that that's an area where 
historically tribes have been ahead of states in thinking about all those things together. And I guess I just want to say that as we move into the future, I think it's an area where the tribes probably have a lot to teach the states and the other administrators in the area about how they think about these things together. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to be out there protecting our storage allocations and those projects just like every other water user will be or my successor will be doing that. I just think that it's, it's something that we're going to be moving towards as we see constraints in the future. And then I think the other thing kind of in the next steps that I think about a lot is what happens when all of the people with the war stories move on or they're not practicing anymore or in the case of my colleague Dan Israel pass away too young and then it's these younger attorneys that don't have the history with the projects and they don't have the history with 40 years of tribal council to work with. And I, I see some of this in my practice as we see new people that are used to certain systems of state administration or certain people who understand theoretically what tribal water rights should look like but aren't as familiar with the settlement. We're going to run into problems where these things that we agreed upon and these systems of some dual administration are become are going to become difficult. And I think that there's a big task for both the state employees, the local water users, and the tribes to put together some sort of educational system that keeps bringing that history forward. Because I think, especially with, if you look at the deals that were struck in the Colorado Ute Settlement, if you don't understand the history, you may have a big problem with one or two things that you're trying to implement. And so I think that there should be a responsibility at the state level and also at the tribal level to make sure that the tribal council leaders like Manuel Hart can come in and explain what the tribe was thinking or what, how did this certain thing get struck in the settlement so we don't end up back in court litigating something that was actually fully fleshed out but maybe not documented as well as it could have been in the settlement. And I think as far as you know, really implementing the settlement. Um, there's still a lot of water infrastructure to be built to bring water, at least to the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. There's no delivery mechanism to bring Animus Lapata water to the tribe unless we let it go through the San Juan River through New Mexico. And if you get me started on that litigation, you'll know why I don't want that to be our delivery mechanism. Um, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of cooperation and a whole lot of money to build water infrastructure. And sometimes it takes even more money to make sure that you have, that you are main, properly maintaining that infrastructure. So those are things that are never going to leave. The tribes are always going to be working on building and maintaining their infrastructure. Um, and it's really exciting work for people like me who get to participate in it. So I would encourage those of you who are young to think about <coughs> this for your tribe or for other tribes. Scott, uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit about marketing. We may be luckier than you guys because we are still uh, negotiating, so <laughs> you never know. <laughs> So, um, and as far as the limitation are concerned, the biggest and most significant complication in implementing the 1992 Settlement Act is related to the interpretation about the scope of the settlement and our conclusion that uh, it only settled claims arising out of the 1965 Deferred Agreement, as is specifically stated in the purpose of the Act and in the waiver provision. We do not view it as a comprehensive final reserved water rights settlement until we receive funding support to put our quantified water rights to use. As Celine pointed out, we need those infrastructure facilities. The other complication that are, has arisen is the leasing of water to the lower basin of reservation. There is much discussion about the exchange of upper basin water with the lower basin, but current compact between the states do not allow it. We would like to be able to market our water to the lower basin where we believe there is a significant opportunity for use of the tribe's water. We will try to get language that, uh, that supports such water transfer in the event 
that the law of the river and current interstate compacts would change to allow it to happen. We may be able to do this more easily with the upper basin. This is currently being negotiated with the state who is asserting the need and right to apply the state change application law and procedure to tribal water right on and off reservation. First, we are disputing the state position that the youth reserve water right used off the reservation will be treated as a state water right under state law, while off the reservation primarily for water leasing, with the exception that the water cannot be forfeited or abandoned under state law and can be returned to the reservation for use. <clears throat> Another limitation is a large portion of the tribe's water right is in the Green River. The use of such water by the tribe is limited mainly because the Green River is far away from the communities of the Ute Indian tribe. And secondly, the river flows in a gorge that makes it expensive to pump the water to serve the lands in high areas. As part of the agreement, the tribe intends to ask the government to store a portion of their water right in Flaming Gorge Dam, make it easier for marketing. I think the last issue is what is next? The main issue is to draft a compact that is agreeable to the tribe and state and feds. It is likely that some form of congressional approval will be necessary because the compact may differ from the version passed in 1992 capital legislation. legislation. Although the state and feds, feds would like to avoid the need for Congress involvement and just make technical edits to the existing 1990 compact. The federal government is approaching the issue as implementation of the 1992 I mean Kafka legislation where the tribe would like to broaden the discussion and generate a new revised compact that addresses the primary outstanding issues. The biggest hurdle to settlement is reservoir storage. The tribe needs reservoir storage to make their water rights reliable and usable. This was known back in 1905 and continued in 1965 deferral agreement and remains to be true now for 100 years. The tribe will push the federal government to support them in constructing reservoir storage for at least their existing projects. Previous efforts to provide tribes with storage have failed. The tribe would argue that the federal government has not fulfilled their obligation to provide tribal storage under the original 1965 agreement and the 1992 Carta Kafka legislation. In addition, close to 20% of water right has been transferred from the Uinta Basin, which is, which is close to the Ute Indian communities, to the Green River, far away from where most of the tribal members reside. If one adds the transferred water right from the Duchesne Basin to the Green River, uh, to a river with that of the tribe's water right from the Green River and its tributary, the White River, of the tribe's total water right, 40% of the tribe's right cannot be used and remains to be paper water right as opposed to wet water. The dilemma for the tribes is the dilemma the tribe is facing is how to convert the paper water, uh, the, the paper water right to a wet water among of which is leasing the water which would require a storage reservoir. The tribe is starting discussion with the federal government to gain storage space in the Flaming Gorge Dam because storage water is readily available when demand for marketing comes through. Furthermore, the Ute Indian tribe are studying the possibility of diverting the water for future irrigation uses, which at this time would require excessive pumping. Moving forward, the hope is that the compact can clarify administrative roles between the state and the tribe. Once this is accomplished, most of the present day conflicts should dissipate. In the future, it would be best if the state engineer and tribal water engineer could work together cooperatively to avoid political influences on both states and on both the state and the tribe sides. This is what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Just as as any final remarks? Well, I'm glad uh, Celine uh, raised this issue of. Uh, mentoring the next generation. I'm totally shocked that I'm now 68 and, and my career went like this. Uh, and I do believe we all have a duty to bring uh, others along here. And I noticed there's a real gender difference in this law school and my law school, Berkeley. When I graduated in 1971 from the University of California Berkeley Law School. There were 25 women and 200 men. That has changed in our generation. 
There's an article I left out here on uh, pro bono legal services, uh, an article that I wrote about the ways that the Colorado Supreme Court is trying to help and support the delivery of pro bono legal ser services to individuals and or organizations that serve those who uh, uh, would not otherwise have counsel. We now have uh, 265 law firms in Colorado committed to this program. In 2006, we had 46. Uh, my colleagues and I from the Court of Appeals, Judge Miller and Judge Gaber and myself, have been walking up and down 17th Street to recruit more firms to commit to this 50 hours per attorney per year average across the firm. Here's my point. It starts with the law schools and it carries into whatever employment you have. This is a core value of our profession. We've got to help our neighbors who otherwise would not be able to compete with those who can pay for legal services sometimes seemingly without end, even though the corporations are catching up with that. Uh, encourage any firm that you're interviewing or, or think of joining to join this list. I know you may be sticking out your neck, so then go talk to your graduates from your law school before that, that when I've got in community and see if they can't work within their culture. We've got to change the culture here what the legal profession is about. And that includes service to community. Uh, so I believe there's lots of opportunity here for pro bono legal service. I just know that there was this tribal wills project out of the DU Law School and they wrote something like 80 wills. And uh, the housing was provided by the Ute, Mountain Ute and Southern Ute tribes for these students to come out and do this. They had the time of their life. It's gonna impact their career. I just know it. The other thing I want to say is this is a great book, in my view. The Ute Indians of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Virginia, McConnell, Simmons. There are several other books out. There could probably be better histories written, but the point is we can sure learn a lot about the life that the Utes enjoyed before we descended upon them and disrupted their movement up to the Granby area where the Colorado Big Thompson Project now sits during the summer and back down to the canyon country during the winter. And just to understand uh, uh, these peoples who are still among us, thank God, because our early governors, territorial and state, did what they could to either have the Utes exterminated or removed from the state. They're here and their flags fly in the capital now, the state capital. Took a while, didn't it? Thank, thanks for your invitation and the program. Thank you much. All right, with that, um, well, I guess we'll excuse Justice Hobson, who got somewhere to be briefly, but um, we'd like to take a couple questions from the audience. Any questions? I just want to, is this on? Yeah. Not, I can probably talk loudly enough. I want to thank the panel. It was really a great um, format and a back and forth discussion. And um, I think this is really a comment more than a question, so I apologize for that, but would love to hear your reactions. Um, so at, I just was struck, Celine, by what you said about worrying about the loss of knowledge. And, and yet, of course, at the same time, you're uh, an excellent example of the younger generation doing what it takes to get what you need to know. And as you acknowledged, of course, the source of knowledge ultimately is your client, the tribe. And even if the older generation of lawyers moves on <laughs> to their next place, um, which we all have to do at some point, um, the, the tribes are here to stay and, and they know uh, the history better than anybody. Um, and you know that too. And so the second thing I wanted to say is that, um, picking up also on Justice Hobbs' comment, is um, I actually don't worry that much about <laughs> the older generation slipping away, and I'm, I'm getting there, so I include myself in that now. Um, because of my students here, um, and because of all my students out there working, two of them up here on the panel, um, former students, I should say, uh, and that there's a, I can hear it in the way that you talk about things, um, 
there's a creativity and a, you know, a new way of thinking about the problems facing you and your clients, the tribes, including perhaps, arguably, more of um, the ecological big picture. And frankly, in some ways, that maps more with what has always been your clients' concerns. And that's just partly generational. And um, I think, you know, I think the way that uh, you all talk about these issues is impressive and complicated, um, and that you know that you have to listen to your elders is all the more reason to think that uh, the future is, is bright, notwithstanding all the challenges that all of you have talked about. Um, so it was really just a shout out to you all, frankly, on the panel and my students here, um, and to follow up on encouraging everyone to continue to go into this kind of work. It's, it's the best and most interesting kind of work. Well, thank you very much. And with that, I'd like you to join me in giving a thanks to our panelists.